it was in your face. I mean, it was no doubt about the return on investment. I mean, companies were doing things like flare stack inspections where you didn't have to shut down an, an entire refinery and you, you, know, you could save you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars each time you conducted these inspections because you didn't have to shut down the, uh, the whole refinery in order to do it or parts of it as you inspected. So... You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun, and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 323. What's happening in the drone industry today? For that question, we head to San Antonio, headquarters for Frost & Sullivan, and speak with Michael Blades, Vice President of Aerospace, Defense, and Security Americas region. Frost & Sullivan provides a comprehensive range of research services and state-of-the-art analytical tools to enable decision makers to use marketing information in more innovative and meaningful ways. Michael is an experienced military aviator with expertise in worldwide aerospace operations. He is an expert in researching and analyzing the military, civil, and commercial unmanned systems ecosystems, as well as markets related to defense training and simulation programs and technologies. In this edition of the Drone Radio Show, Michael talks about some of the current trends in the drone industry. This is the first of two interviews with Michael. Today we cover autonomy and AI, precision measurement drones, American drone manufacturing, and data integration. But before we hear from Michael, I want to thank those of you who are supporting my funding campaign. Whether it's a dollar, $100, or much more, you can help defray the cost of production and keep the podcast going and growing. Go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate. And by the way, if you have a great story on the use of drones that you'd like to share in a podcast, contact me at Randy at DroneRadioShow.com. So let's learn about the current trends in the drone industry with Michael Blades of Frost & Sullivan. Let's pick up the interview where I asked Michael to introduce himself. I'm Mike Blades. I am the uh, Vice President for Aerospace and Defense uh, globally, actually, for uh, 20 analysts that I manage who conduct a, a wide range of research in uh, five different areas within aerospace defense. We cover airports and airlines, commercial aviation, uh, unmanned systems, um, space, and then defense, which obviously defense is our largest area. Michael, for those that may not be aware of Frost & Sullivan, what does the company do? Well, Frost & Sullivan is positions itself as a growth pipeline company. The uh, idea is to help our clients grow their businesses regardless of what uh, vertical they're in or what business area they're in. We, we cover 10 different markets, uh, you know, market segments that we call them, and with aerospace and defense just being one of them. But um, our focus is sort of twofold. One half of our business conducts subscription research for our clients. And then the other half of our business is um, growth consulting. So we have a slew of consultants that conduct proprietary research for our clients based on particular areas they want to look at. And a lot of times that is a result of the subscription research that we do, which is, you know, sort of a, a macro level view. And then that macro level view kind of generates interest in some micro level requests. Basically, we, uh, we conduct research on a subscription basis and we conduct it on a proprietary basis, just depending on what our clients need, all in an effort to help them grow the bottom line, obviously. Based on your research, what are some of the trends that are driving the industry forward right now? Well, there's several trends. We like to identify trends and make predictions. We see key drivers in the industry being autonomy and artificial intelligence. We don't think the industry is going to move rapidly forward unless those two specific technologies are really um, advanced and uh, adopted. Of course, they're, they're sort of interrelated where, you know, artificial intelligence drives some of the autonomy. But artificial intelligence can be, you know, used in both the operation of the drone, making it more autonomous, and also 
uh, automating the, the data collection and processing. So both of those things take the human element out of the picture, which is good for two things, one, cost savings, and two, for contactless operation, which has been highlighted, obviously, by the response to COVID. So um, that's one set of trends. We see a lot of increased use in advanced sensors, a lot of LIDAR. LIDAR has been very popular, but it's also been very expensive. But LIDAR sensors are, are getting less expensive, so their, their costs are decreasing quite rapidly while the capabilities that they provide are increasing, both from a, a solid state and, and a traditional point of view on the sensor side. So it's enabling some more precise measurement taking when you're conducting various inspections and whatnot. So, and, and that in, in itself is a trend. I mean, we can mention LIDAR by itself, but we, we also see a trend, you know, I was actually watching an AUVSI webinar today and, and uh, one of the speakers and there was exactly right that we, I mean, we're still just at the dawn of using drones for commercial purposes and commercial uses. And what we're seeing is a transition from drone operators using drones to, to sell a, a capability. But we're, now what we're seeing is instead of being a drone operator using a drone to solve a problem, we're seeing subject matter experts bring drones in as a tool to solve or make the, the problems that they deal with on a daily basis either make them operate more efficiently, more cost effectively, or more safe. So we've seen that transition. But we've had DJI and some of the, the less expensive drones take the lead in, in this market for quite some time because they've been very inexpensive and, and, and they still are. and, and a lot of the drones that you know are sub five thousand dollar drones are very capable in what they do. But what we're starting to see is now that people understand and companies understand what drones can do and the the efficiencies and benefits they can provide. We're seeing a lot more concentration on more precise, you know, maybe more bringing more expensive platforms and more expensive sensors, but in order to conduct very precise operations, you know, like a company like Skyfish or a company like SkyGage with platforms that are specifically designed to give you very precise and accurate measurements, you know, so that you have a uh, advantage over your competitors in, in doing specific things, whether it's, you know, measuring uh, available space on cell towers to in integrate 5G systems and antennas and whatnot, or, or, you know, just those kinds of things. So we're starting to see that trend where, you know, it's not just the inexpensive platforms, you know, accounting for a lion's share of, of what's happening with the uh, market overall, but more of, of a, a trend towards enterprise operations with more advanced platforms and sensors. Let's start with autonomy and AI. I know this may be subjective, but how would you characterize the progress that has been made in the past year on autonomy and AI. What we are seeing is a lot more focus on autonomy and AI. That's also being driven by how the regulatory agencies are are dealing with those capabilities. You know, if you're able to show that your uh, your autonomous drone or your semi-autonomous drone can do specific things and, and be safe, then you're going to be able to get uh, waivers much quicker. I mean, you can take what Skydio has been able to achieve uh, in North Carolina with the bridge inspections for the Beyond Visual Line of Sight approvals. And then uh, same thing with aerobotics and the, you know sort of the drone in the box solution. And, and that, that's half the autonomy that's built into the system. And it's half because of the accelerated response to COVID that was required within 24 hours there to get a waiver to operate Beyond Visual Line of Sight and, and the application that they had to do. How does AI and autonomy relate to each other? You know, autonomy and AI are sort of going hand in hand, but AI covers a lot more area. And I think AI is, to me, it's a conundrum because, you know, in order to have good AI, you have to have a lot, a lot, a lot of data, you know, to inform models and whatnot. So, you know, the AI is only going to grow and advance as fast as you can feed the data into it. So it's, it's sort of reliance on that. So if you can get a lot of good data able to uh, train the AI models, then that's going to advance quicker. If you're not, then it's going to advance slower. But the bottom line is both of those are advancing at what I would the SANS Accelerator Array because the solutions providers are understanding that that's what, what's going to have to be involved in the process, you know, whether it's the operation of the drone, whether it's the processing of data and, and the workflow. And, and then also another trend that we're seeing is unmanned, unmanned teaming and also considering taking data from other sensors that are not necessarily unmanned. So you have, and you can see this with Caspery, you can see it with Percepto. They all have these um, open architecture solutions. They're able to bring in data from uh, a wide range of sensors and then process it all together instead of being sort of stovepiped 
Percepto has the partnership with Spot and I guess Asalon, which is another solutions company for their teaming unmanned aircraft with unmanned ground systems. So you're getting data from sensors that are, you know, on two different platforms, but they're being integrated into one common workflow. And then furthermore, you know, you can go beyond that and bring in handheld sensor data, you know, if, if you can't get the either kind of drone into a place that you want. And then, you know, taking all of those different data collection methods and putting them into the same workflow to come up with a more precise uh, set of data. It's interesting how the whole data collection and integration area is really becoming a major field of its own. It is. And I mean, it kind of goes along with big data. I mean, that's been sort of a catchphrase for a while, but, you know, with all these sensors and, you know, and 5G is just going to exacerbate that because you're going to be able to not only collect more data, but transform more data across the data links and also with lower latency. So, you know, you're going to have to really be able to take that all that data and have a place to store it in a cloud and have a place to process it all and, and have a, a more advanced method or capability for uh, processing the data or else you're just going to get data overload. So that's a huge problem. You know, to me, that's two of the, the biggest problems that we're going to have in the future. Well, it probably exists now, but it's just going to accelerate in the future. And AI can help with this, but choosing which data to actually process, you know, AI can say, look, we don't need that data, so let's not include that in what actually needs to be processed. And the sheer amount of data you're going to be collecting and processing and storing, and then also data security. So I think those two things are the big challenges in the future. The technology exists, right? The technology exists right now to do quite a few things. We can we could probably find beyond beyond visual line of sight a lot more than we do now because there's technologies out there that will allow you to, you know, fly autonomously and, and keep yourself away from other aircraft and, you know, obstacle points. I mean SkyDio drones do it now. You could have the data going back and forth electronically to give your position and have a sort of a, a ground-based sense and avoid as well as an airborne sense and avoid capability in order to keep aircraft apart. All that stuff obviously has to be tested, but I think the, the technology is out there. It's just a matter of setting standards and getting all those things tested in order to show that, yeah, it, the technology works and, and, and this is how it works. And we, we show that it works, but now we put it in a regulation. So the technology with drones has always been and will continue to be more advanced than the regulatory agencies globally, actually, the ability to keep up with the, the advances in technology. So that has been a, a market restraint and will continue to be a market restraint. But, you know, I think there's a lot of good people, a lot of smart people and a lot of good companies out there that are trying to work together towards a solution that drives the market forward. You mentioned how subject matter experts were moving the industry forward. How are they doing that? If you think about the first companies uh, that were really offering drone services and you know, it was before autonomy or, or before drones were highly autonomous and a lot of it was around the oil and gas industry and it was uh, you know, a company like um, Sky Futures and Cyberhawk. Those two companies were you know, in, in Europe and sort of had a little bit more leeway if you go back in time and look at who was allowed to do more with drones first. You know, Europe was, was sort of ahead of us and, and kind of still are really when it comes to creating a regulatory environment. So they're putting together now a, um, an EU standard for you know operating drones so that you don't have to operate from different rules every time you go to a different country uh, when it comes to the commercial drones. So those are both oil and gas companies and the subject matter experts brought those tools in because the ROI was just so, it was in your face. I mean, it was no doubt about the, the return on investment. I mean, Companies were doing things like flare stack inspections where you didn't have to shut down an, an entire refinery and you, you, know, you could save you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars each time you conducted these inspections because you didn't have to shut down the, uh, the whole refinery in order to do it or parts of it as you inspected. So the subject matter experts, as they realized that drones could benefit what they were doing, they brought them in as tools. And so, you know, the difference being now these different subject matter experts are required to do inspections and they understand what the inspections entail and they know that they need an inspection grade or inspection quality system in order to affect a good inspection. You're trying to do something with a drone that doesn't have that capability. You're not gaining any benefit. There was this crossover between what drones could do and the subject matter experts that realized what different specifications they needed in order to meet the requirements of an inspection, and they put those two together. And it has kind of filtered down from, you know, what has the most ROI and, you know, also what industries have the kind of money to invest initially. So it was pretty easy for the uh, the oil and gas industry to sort this adoption. And as things got cheaper and, and, and more capable, then we started seeing more use in construction and telecommunications 
lens with regards to, you know, tower inspections and, and those things. And you still see that when you compare all those different areas, it's still very uh, at the back end is precision agriculture. And it's just because the ROI is so hard to justify when you're talking about crops that, you know, you have to have a huge difference in output or in, you know, cost savings with regards to fertilizers and things like that in order to justify using the drones. And so anyway, you could talk about each of those areas separately, but where we've seen a lot of that subject matter experts bringing the drones into their, their tool chest is where they really understand the inspection process or, or what is they're doing and how the drones can benefit them rather than the other way around where someone's just flying a drone around and don't really, they really don't understand how it could help because they didn't have any background or experience in that particular industry. With the emphasis being on more specialized measurement or specialized solutions, does that provide an opening for more American manufacturers? Well, I think just the geopolitical issues are causing that. I mean, you can see that with the blue SUAS program and the, the continued sort of push to have legislation that limits what Chinese companies can offer the government, you know, or what, what the government can purchase that's Chinese and, you know, DJI being on the entity list. Um, I'm told that's not going to be such a big deal because whatever they can get in the U.S. with regards to processing chips and things like that, they can get somewhat equal capability in China. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's that's sort of the information that I'm getting. So I don't know that the entity list is going to be as big a deal for DJI. Um, I think the legislation and just the, um, I guess, overall sort of negative sentiment toward the Chinese makers is, is what's going to cause an opportunity for U.S. drone makers to sort of step in and, and create an industrial base. There's a lot of support, a lot of spending on the, the government. So, I mean, you, the government's not supposed to be able to buy sort of Chinese product, whether it's platforms or, or certain supporting equipment. I can't remember what all it is, but I think there's like controllers and, and a bunch of different things that were listed. But there's also, I think, going to be a lot of investment. Uh, I mean, we're, we're estimating there's probably between a half a billion and a billion dollars invested in these U.S. companies, whether it's platform makers or services providers, whatever, to sort of bolster that, that U.S. capability. Because I think what you said is true. I think there's going to be a demand, an increasing demand, or we're we're predicting and, we're, and we see the trend of increasing demand for U.S. made uh, products that are, I don't want to say the use case specific, but they focus on applications that the less expensive drums don't. Because all this boils down to is, is security, right? Whether it, where there's actual data security issues or there's perceived data security issues, if you don't really care about whether your data can go to a Chinese server or, or whatever it is, because you're just taking photos and videos and posting them wherever, or you know you're using it for a, let's say for example, it's a you're, you're a real estate agent, and you're using a drone for taking pictures and videos of, of homes that you're going to sell. You don't want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a drone to do that because you really don't care. It's not going to be a, a national security issue if your home pictures get out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, to the world. They're getting put on the internet anyways, right? In the MLS or whatever. So, but those are going to continue to be popular. And those companies that are making the, the drones in the U.S. aren't really looking to compete in that area. Where they're looking to compete is in the areas like the, the companies like Skyfish and like I said before, SkyGauge, where they're looking at these enterprise applications that are able to conduct inspections and you know highly precise and accurate types of uh, inspections and applications the the five or $6,000 drones and under aren't made to do. So that said, there's also companies like Skydio that are going to be in, in sort of that prosumer area that challenges DJI with autonomous flight. I think there's some argument as to whether a, a DJI Mavic 2 can do the sort of same things as Skydio. I think if you look at the entire enterprise capability of what Skydio does with its autonomy and not just autonomy of the flight, but the autonomy of the uh, data collection and the autonomous inspection capability. I don't want to say it's night and day, but the differences are, are pretty clear. So, um, yeah. That's a, a long way of answering your question is yes, I think there's going to be quite a bit more opportunity uh, for several reasons for U.S. manufacturers to benefit in the future. That's it for Episode 323 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Michael Blades of Frost & Sullivan. I want to thank Michael for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about Frost & Sullivan or want to connect with Michael, check out the website at www.frost.com. If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, 
but for as little as $1, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate. And thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me, and I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.